Well, Mick, welcome. Um, you go back a long way here at the Cruising Yacht Club. How did you first become involved with the club? Well, I've been uh, in and around the uh, club since about 1951. Uh, my earliest actual involvement is that I had my Bucks party, Bucks party here. Uh, it went in the old wooden shed before the first building was built. Uh, at a time when there was this wonderful ritual of uh, stripping the poor attending bridegroom naked and uh, painting him in certain areas with, with ink and then throwing them out of the front window uh, into the uh, at high tide uh, 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 over the edge when, in, into the muddy water. On my occasion, unfortunately, the uh, uh, tide was only half tide and it was full of rocky shell, uh, oyster shells. I got cut about rather badly, but however, that was my first <laughs> first uh, uh, encounter with the CYC as such. But I used to sail with, I, I, I did some sailing. I was originally a bushwalker and uh, I, I was invited by Bill Salters, who was a childhood friend, uh, who had a, a, an eight metre called E. And uh, we sailed with him. And uh, consequently, later on, a, uh, a friend of mine actually gave me an, uh, one of the original VJs. It wasn't a VJ that was uh, made of ply, it was planked. It was one of the original Sil Rohu VJs. And the first time we ever took it out, uh, it filled with water and we had to get rid of it. So but I, I got another one and that uh, engendered a, 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 a wish to go sailing. So uh, anyhow, finally we went up through the ranks into a couple of other small boats. In fact, I bought another boat that Bill Tolters used to own called, War, called Narada, which was an open 22-footer, and uh, which I raced with the amateurs. Uh, but on the, uh, on the off days, uh, I used to always hang around the CYC with Bill and did some ocean racing with him. And finally, when the club uh, got going, Merv Davy came here and uh, I got very friendly with Merv because I knew uh, Mick York and Jeanette, and Jeanette York very well. They were close friends. We used to be socialise a lot. And uh, I went sailing with him on trade winds. And uh, so I, that was my first taste of ocean racing. And uh, that's how I got it. Finally, I got the, the wish to buy something and do the same thing. Uh, at that, not, not too long after that, uh, in, I uh, bought an old cutter uh, and it was uh, built by Hayes and uh, I brought it over to a moor here at the uh, at Bushy Shed next door which was owned by Richard Arrowsmith and uh, I, as a result of that I started doing short races, the short races that the club was offering offshore. And uh, I then became Commodore of the Sydney Amateur Sailing Club, which at that point had recently only acquired a clubhouse after having not had a clubhouse for something like 70 years. The original clubhouse was at uh, Benelong Point actually and was resumed by the government and they chose not to have any clubhouse. But I, as a result of that, I felt that I would like to be the first Commodore to take the boat, a boat to Sydney Hob in the Sydney Hobart race, uh, we wanted to try and bring the amateurs into the 20th century, so as to speak, and uh, consequently, uh, uh, that sometime uh, shortly after that, I uh, there was Lolita, my yacht was, uh, which is notable for the fact that uniquely it's the. Uh, it, it, was the first boat that ever did a complete role in the Sydney Hobart race and finally got what towed out of trouble uh, by a submarine. And I'm sure that I have pictures of that which I'm sure are quite unique. I'm not sure that there's anyone else. You, you didn't own Lolita then, no, did you? No. She was owned by John Farron Price. Right. And uh, she, she'd actually been on Lake Eucumbing 
for two years. And the owner of that found it wasn't quite suitable to have an ocean going yacht on a lake. So he actually did a swap for a motor cruiser that John Farron Price owned called Ariel. And uh, so, but the point is, on his, his nephew was Brian Farron Price, who was the first Australian in South Australia to win a world title on, in a uh, sailing event, which was the 505s. So he, at that time, Hobart was the place where uh, there was a market for those, sort, those sorts of boats. It's a 35-foot wooden sloop, and they decided to take her down the Hobart race. And fortuitously, they got a skipper called Rob, Bob Young to take it down, and she had that event I told you about, about rolling it, and uh, she lost a mast. So at, at the point of time I started looking for a yacht, she was lying at the CYC. Uh, with sorry, the, sorry, if I could interrupt there. If we go back just to Lolita before you bought it when she was rolled in mm. the Sydney Hobart race. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but she rolled and then subsequent to that she got dismasted and then she got blown to seaward off Tasmania, northeastern tip of Tasmania, which is something like 100 miles to seaward of Tasmania. And mm. Bob Young, who you referred to, he rigged up some aerial to get the Morse code going and he said that. Well, let me, let me just elucidate a little bit of detail yeah. I've seen to raise it. What happened with that rescue could probably not have happened with modern technology. Uh, in those days, as you well know, the most of the gear we had was ex uh, service gear from disposals, and the, the radio that they had was an, a, one out of an army tank. It was about this big. I still I had it uh, where I put, uh, where I bought the boat, and I kept it for some years. And uh, now, what in fact happened was that when they did the roll, uh, they uh, more than half full of water, more than half full of water, uh, and the old story of a frightened man with a bucket, a theory came in and they managed to, uh, I've got the story in detail from Bob of course, uh, they managed to empty it out virtually, uh, he told me just one more way when they would have gone down, uh, and they managed to get the bit of uh, empty in about three hours, two or three hours, had a petrol engine, uh, which was obviously soaked. And they managed to get that going after about another hour or two by throwing all their available hard liquor, rum and uh, whiskey all over it, and then set it alight. And they dried out the motor and they actually got it going. Uh, now, what had happened is that uh, the, the when she was lying here, she was lying here with a broken stump of a wooden mast. Everybody had thought that when she, that mast had broken when on the way up from the roll and therefore the, the mast being into the, uh, through the deck into the keel would have wrecked the boat. And it virtually she lay here for a minimum of 18 months, just, just nobody wanted to look at it, she was really just state of disrepair. And uh, I was up at the old coast's retreat bar we used to have and uh, we were by ourselves actually and Rob told me the story about how he found himself under the water trying to unclip his uh, safety harness and suddenly we were thinking well I'm 60 miles offshore what the heck's it? Uh, I got used to doing that next thing he flipped back and he was back in the cockpit uh, and so on. Anyhow what happened was that uh, he was telling me about it and he said, oh, he said, we, after we pumped her out, we were sailing for a while and then the force they broke. And that was, gave me the spark. I, I'd looked at the boat and I didn't want to buy it. But then he said, the force they broke 20 minutes after we pumped her out. So I thought, oh, you know, she, she mean there's nothing wrong with the boat? Oh, no, she's as good as she ever was. So I came and had a look at, had a look at it, had a survey and Certainly, the whole of, even today is as good as it was the way it was built. Yeah. Few and fine boats, mate. Yeah. With, uh, uh, obviously, uh, the best boat building boat woods in the world. Yeah. And so, anyhow, what happened? They 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 rigged the jury rig, and they only had a little bit of uh, petrol. So the jury rig to go back to the coast. They got within the coast uh, about 15 miles, and a sou'wester came up and blew them back out again. 
And so they sailed back in again and they didn't use the radio because, of course, the, the factories were very flat. They didn't want to, they only had a limited amount of petrol uh, fuel to uh, charge batteries, so they uh, refrained from putting any calls out because, as you know, those old microphones used to yeah. suck out a lot of power. So anyhow, long and short of it is they went back a second time and the same thing happened. They, now this time they were drifting back into the Great Southern Ocean without any supplies, they'd running out of water, they'd run out of food, and he didn't have a, a radio. Uh, now they'd retrieved a lot of the uh, uh, wire from the broken mast which was, had been floating next, next to them. So he rigged up a field across the, uh, the front of the, uh, the forward of the mast and then took out, took a sight and uh, then took out two uh, valves that he knew about, connected them up to this field through the batteries and tapped out a Morse message. Now by this time they were something like I believe about 45 to 50 miles southwest south-east of uh, uh, the coast. Uh, anyhow, as the luck would have it, the, the fisherman who was going into Ho Sydney Ho into Hobart uh, picked up the signal and knew Morse, because not a lot of people knew Morse mm -hmm. at that time, and passed it on to Hobart Radio. Uh, at that point of time, coming down the coast, was a, a, an English submarine called the Trump, the skipper of which was a yachty who was going to spend his Christmas holidays sailing back to Sydney on one of the Hobart boats. And he picked up the, the yeah, fix, did something probably he shouldn't have done. I don't know whether it was allowable for uh, service people to go to do civilian rescues, but that's what he did. I have a photograph of the conning tower of that boat this is taken by one of the crew on our on Rolita, coming out of the water, probably less than a mile away, less half to three quarters of a mile away. So you can imagine what a feat of navigation that was, right? Uh, and I also have a photograph of the of the of the, the boat of Rolita, the tow line to the to the sub uh, being done. She when she was towed in, and finally she was towed into St Helens. So uh, I bought the boat and... So uh, what year did you buy it, Lily? It was 1963 and uh, I bought the boat and I was then Commodore and that was... Of the Amateurs? Yes. Commodore of the Amateurs, yeah. So that's where I achieved, you know, we wanted to bring the Amateurs out of the, the, the uh, Victorian era, yeah. era into the modern era because ocean racing was just starting and was just yeah. becoming popular, etc. So uh, anyhow, we, I had a, uh, uh, I won't say very much about how or why this happened, but uh, we, we, I wanted work done to the boat to fix her up and we went in the Hobart race uh, and uh, we were about three quarters of the way down, we were down off Gaber actually and, and struck a very hard uh, southerly uh, gale force wind and found that we had no steering. So we were pretty unfortunate. We had to, uh, fortunately the wind was south, so we managed to turn her about and shove, we sailed her up the coast under sail only, just, with, uh, just, just put the, easing the tension on the main and I pulled out Hetzel. And finally we got up to Aladulla, where, where the wind had died out and the nor'easter came in, and we managed to uh, weave our way through the uh, uh, breakwaters and uh, anchored just off the beach. And at that, that, is, that time, uh, I had two very experienced seamen aboard, one, about, one bloke who'd been brought up at the dories of the Newfoundland uh, in the fishing fleets since a boy. And uh, the, whilst we were there, uh, sort of bemoaning our fate, uh, it was noticed that the tide was coming in. 
So uh, a suggestion was made that, oh, we could careen this boat and see what's wrong. And we swam and broke out to the one of the, we had two anchors out the back, and we pulled one of those anchors up onto the beach from, and pulled her up onto the beach at Aladulla uh, with tide. And uh, about, I think it was about 11 o'clock at night, we, we had, as you know, I mentioned that we had dis uh, uh, disposal gear. We had a, made a raft of May West that I had. They were the, they were the my first of the day, and uh, we, I always carried a, a mask, and uh, we had a bit of tubing on board, and one of our crew was a fitter and turner. So we made a raft of the May West, and I had a waterproof torch, and we stuck him on this raft with, with peg on his nose, and with the light, and lo and behold, we were able to, we found that the, the uh, the, sh the shaft of the uh, uh, chiller, the helm was only just about um, a metre and a half below the water and we were able to work on it uh, at the high tide. And uh, we actually extracted the uh, shaft uh, and we found out that uh, the engineer of the day had forgotten to put the, the key in the keyway. Uh, and that was what caused the problem and finally uh, we found a, uh, a, a very big, heavy screw uh, in the, uh, on the boat and we filed it down and made up a key. And uh, uh, when the uh, tide came in again, we, we put it all together. When the tide came again, we just simply winched her off on the... Uh, it made front page news on the local paper and in, on the Telegraph too, incidentally. So anyhow, uh, we, we continued on with the race and in spite of the fact that tourists were surrounding the boat offering us beer and chocolate and all else, didn't take any outside assistance and uh, we continued on with the race. Then we got halfway across the straits and unfortunately the screw was only mono. It was fairly, you need a really hard metal screw for that. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, not to call it a screw, but the, 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 I, um, what do you call it? The key. The key. Yeah. And it was only soft metal and it started to go again, so I elected to turn tail and come home. But that was my first Hobart race. Right. right. Well, it's still a good story, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, all these years on, you still own the leader and you still race yes, the leader. So yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, she's now 67 years old and this is my 50th year of ownership. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. And what, what about, Nick, um, you know, with your long history, some of the characters that you've met through the years through the CYC? I mean, there's many oh, and varied, isn't there? Oh, terrific job. Yeah. I mean, the, the, those sorts of characters as such, uh, I don't say they don't exist, they obviously do, because the character of the boats they sail in is different. You know, you've seen the club in, in all the years, you know, there have been some terrific people that have contributed so much. I mean, Norman Ridge, Bill Solders, yeah, Robert Crichton Brown, people, yeah. and Merv Davey, yeah. who you were close to, yeah. the one, and Gordon Marshall. Yeah. Now, they put so much in to make this club what it is. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it, it was surprising that, uh, that here we are, uh, uh, in the antipodes, 12,000 miles from anywhere, and we became a, we're leading the world in, in ocean racing uh, theory. Yeah. Uh, and especially after we went to the Admiral's Cup and uh, sort of probably sharpened up their, 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 the, the Northern Hemisphere approach to uh, ocean racing as such, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and your, your, lo your love of, of, um, of cruising, um, you've done a lot to promote the cruising division of the club over the years? Well, what happened was... I'd like to elaborate on this slightly. Uh, we, I ocean raced, at the time we were ocean racing, it was built in 1946. Uh, and we ocean raced uh, until about 1973 or 4, I think it was, when we actually won our third division uh, point score. Now that meant we had to crowd more and more gear on it. We had to crowd more modern gear that was designed, it wasn't designed as a masthead sloop, she designed as a three-quarter rig. 
uh, and she was therefore she ended up as a, a mast header uh, with extra with a lot of extra gear on it. And in order to hang it, uh, keep up with the new the new fiberglass boats that were coming on in those days, like the Duncansons, for example, uh, and various other boats that were coming on the market. We had to drive her harder and harder, and she was starting, she was starting to feel the pinch. So uh, I decided to that we, I probably should uh, not bust the boat up yeah. and take, re, take her off the, ocean, the hard ocean racing beat. I found that you know we we have a hypnosis here, justifiably so, with the Sydney Hobart race. That was the main focus of the club. Uh, plus all the other races we used to do at the time, uh, and uh, but there was nothing for a boat like mine, or indeed any other boat like mine. I looked at the number of boats that we had on them. They by that time had the new marina, and uh, on the mooring, I think it was, the number was something like two hundred and. 30 or 240 votes on, that we had of, uh, on, uh, on our books, of which 48 went out every Saturday and raced, uh, or raced in the ocean races. So that was, what, less than a quarter, three quarters of the votes would have been used. So uh, the other thing I, it occurred to me, yeah, it, it would have helped the club's finance if we had, we managed to to gather those boats together to, to have some activity which would helpfully, hopefully bring some revenue back to the club. Well, I've got a, a bunch of people together. Now, no other club in Sydney ever had such a similar division. Uh, and it was quite apparent that it, then that what was needed was a cooperative effort from all the clubs. So uh, I had a talk to people at the CY, at the squadron, and also at the Middle Harbour. And uh, anyhow, uh, we then formed what we called a cruising division. Now, I tried to find it, and I will, try, I will find it. There was a newspaper, a marine newspaper at the time, uh, a bit like a float, but which was a, it was a little broadsheet. And it, made a, a frontline news item of Nick Cassim and his cruising rebels, which really, I've, I've still got that and I'd like to donate it to the club when I can find it because I've moved house and I can't find it. And I mean, it seemed like a great anomaly to have a cruising yacht club having rebels within it who wanted to go cruising, right? Now, in order to try and attract people, we, we had some rather odd, uh, we, we took an, an, an odd approach, an offbeat approach, rather than have just a, a straight, ordinary guy and have a raft up, etc. We tried to make it interesting for families. So I did a survey on the chart of all the bays where we could have raft ups, but particularly where there might be sort of uh, uh, activities ashore, playground activities ashore, uh, barbecues ashore, etc., which meant getting everybody ashore. Uh, and what we did is to live it up. We organised such things as treasure hunts, uh, we, navigational exercises, waypoints around various. We nominate various waypoints, and everybody had to go to these waypoints and then go to the final place. Things that to try to make it interesting, yeah. uh, and uh, and organise, and we also were able to organise people who had rubber duckies to transport people. And what we did on the first occasion, for example, I would have to make this educated guess. Uh, we, we nominated a, a flag for every uh, bay that we thought was appropriate for the day. I used to stand off on a leader. We put up a flag. Uh, and guess where the wind was coming from? And uh, we all had to go in a line up the harbour to uh, up the river. And we tried to stay away from the lower harbour. We tried to go up into the river because yeah. the water was quieter up there. On the first day that we went, it was midday in July, 
a, mid, a, mid, a, mid, a day in July of that year, and it was dead calm. And we had some middle harbour yachts and a couple of squadron boats. They, called, they formed a division they called a Hop, Skip and Jump Division. And we had a couple of them, and we had 28 boats all in one line on several anchors and stern anchors over at Northwood, because there's a park there and you could go, the kids could go ashore, etc. And I have a photo of that. Just dead calm. That was a, one of the first efforts we put on. And another one we uh, was, we had, uh, when Peter Rizdick yeah. was uh, around and, and Commodore up at the Gosford Aquatic Club, we had, we organised a group with, we had 30 boats in a line going up underneath Rip Bridge up towards, and we all got up to Gosford, to, to the Gosford Aquatic Club. Is it still running? Are you still doing much of that at all? Does the club do much of that at all these days? The, the, the uh, no, I, I, I haven't seen anything advertised of that nature at, at the moment. I'd like to see it happen, but I don't know what what degree of participation they get uh, in... Uh, uh, I, I had the letter on the marina here for something like 40 years. Uh, at, at fact, Mickleborough and I used to have an argument as to who was the longest, and I know that I was because I had my old cutter here before he did. But, uh, the, but uh, during, as, then, I, then I took it over to the squadron because I bought a house over in, on Clontarf. Uh, but they are just waking up to the same necessity of, of having people, more people come to the club and, and, uh, and the way to do it through the cruising division. Well, and, and uh, as we wrap up, a question I ask most people, what, what do you think of ocean racing these days and the boats that they're, they're sailing? <coughs> Well, the, like all older people, one's inclined to think, well, things aren't what they used to be. But you have to live with technology. We, 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 we sort of cars we drive now, if we went to that philosophy, we should be driving T model Fords. So the type of yacht that uh, is racing at the moment. Uh, it, it, it's a symbol of the times with, with the sort of technology that's available. But one of the things that has happened is that it's erased, in my opinion, the t type of camaraderie and seamanship that used to apply to the smaller boats. It also, it seems to me, to have taken away the, uh, the ability of the, uh, with the middle class yacht owner, like myself, uh, to get into the Sydney Hobart race, or even want to go into it. Because obviously, with the cost uh, of, of running the race, or getting into the race, uh, is such that uh, it just forces them to back into other activities. Now, uh, so therefore it seems to me that the the problem with the fact that we have the Tattersall's Club uh, and the uh, the rules that try to equate the uh, possibility of winning aren't have, have, by virtue of uh, the sort of demands of sponsorship to uh, in, in, uh, encourage that public interest in the race forces the media to concentrate on the maxis and that sort of thing. The handicap winner is, is a, certainly, a, is, is not a big, it, it, nobody even probably knows down in the public who won the race apart from the right? Uh, so the, it seems to me that the, the uh, powers of be should be thinking about trying to create a second tier of type racing like we used to have. It, by force of uh, population, there are far more people racing now. When I was racing, we knew everybody in every division in the race. Uh, it was marvellous to come back on a Saturday after a, a, a ocean race at Coogee or out, out to the nine mile boy we used to have here off Long Reef. 
and we'd say, where's the party on tonight? So they'd be, instead of going home, we'd ring our, call our ladies, and they'd come down, we'd have dinner down here, and everybody would turn down to somebody's boat. I've had over 18 to 20 people in the boat. We used to buy a keg from the club and put it in the forepeak, and we'd have a keg, and people would be standing on the, on the wharf having a drink late at night, one or two, and very often a couple of us would go out at two o'clock in the morning and have a, a, a sail if the conditions were right. You see, uh, I, can, I can remember when Rupert Murdoch had Olena here. He had a piano in the saloon, right? And some of the parties we had down there were fantastic. And of course, well, that's, that, the old Mickleborough boys, they were yeah. the ones that used to yeah. get down there. And uh, it, it just a shame that that sort of uh, um, attitude to fun yeah. has changed because yeah. per force of the fact that you have these bigger crews, everybody tends to stay amongst themselves and you don't get to know anybody. Yeah, and there aren't too many anyway. The uh, camaraderie has disappeared to a certain extent. Yes, and, and, and that's, that's, that's nobody's fault. It's, it's, a, it's a fault of, fault of nature and progress. Yeah. Well, Nick, thank you very much. I mean, you, it's great to see you're still active. Thanks yeah. for your contribution to the club. It's been marvellous over all these years through your legal work and uh, your cruising work. And uh, you're off this weekend down to Hobart for the Wooden Boat Festival. I am, yes. Let's uh, uh, keep up the good work and keep in good health. And thank you. I appreciate your help, Peter. Thank you. And good luck to the club in the future. It doesn't need it. It's going great guns. Good on.